Chapter 36, Part 5 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Whilst the vacant throne of Italy was abandoned to lawless barbarians, the election of a new colleague was seriously agitated in the Council of Leo. The Empress Verena, studious to promote the greatness of her own family, had married one of her nieces to Julius Nepos, who succeeded his uncle Marcellinus in the sovereignty of Dalmatia, a more solid possession than the title which he was persuaded to accept of Emperor of the West. But the measures of the Byzantine court were so languid and irresolute that many months elapsed after the death of Anthemius, and even of Olybrius, before their destined successor can show himself with a respectable force to his Italian subjects. During that interval, Glycarius, an obscure soldier, was invested with the purple by his patron Gundobald, but the Burgundian prince was unable or unwilling to support his nomination by a civil war. The pursuits of domestic ambition recalled him beyond the Alps, and his client was permitted to exchange the Roman scepter for the bishopric of Salona. After extinguishing such a competitor, the emperor Nepos was acknowledged by the Senate and the Italians and by the provincials of Gaul. His moral virtues and military talents were loudly celebrated, and those who derived any private benefit from his government announced, in prophetic strains, the restoration of the public felicity. Their hopes, if such hopes had been entertained, were confounded within the term of a single year, and the treaty of peace, which ceded Auvergne to the Visigoths, is the only event of his short and inglorious reign. The most faithful subjects of Gaul were sacrificed by the Italian emperor to the hopes of domestic security, but his repose was soon invaded by a furious sedition of the barbarian confederates, who, under the command of Orestes, their general, were in full march from Rome to Ravenna. Nepos trembled at their approach, and instead of placing a just confidence in the strength of Ravenna, he hastily escaped to his ships and retired to his Dalmatian principality on the opposite coast of the Hadriatic. By this shameful abdication he protracted his life about five years, in a very ambiguous state between an emperor and an exile, till he was assassinated at Salona by the ungrateful Glycarius, who was translated, perhaps as the reward of his crime, to the archbishopric of Milan. The nations who had asserted their independence after the death of Attila were established, by the right of possession or conquest, in the boundless countries to the north of the Danube, or in the Roman provinces between the river and the Alps. But the bravest of their youth enlisted in the army of confederates, who formed the defense and the terror of Italy. And in this cuous multitude, the names of the Heruli, the Scyri, the Alani, the Tucurlingi, and the Rugians appear to have predominated. The example of these warriors was imitated by Orestes, the son of Tatulus, and the father of the last Roman emperor of the West. Orestes, who had already been mentioned in this history, had never deserted his country. His birth and fortunes rendered him one of the most illustrious subjects of Pannonia. When that province was ceded to the Huns, he entered into the service of Attila, his lawful sovereign, obtained the office of his secretary, and was repeatedly sent ambassador to Constantinople, to represent the person and signify the commands of the imperious monarch. The death of that conqueror restored him to his freedom, and Orestes, might honorably refuse either to follow the sons of Attila into the Scythian desert, or to obey the Ostrogoths, who had usurped the dominion of Pannonia. He preferred the service of the Italian princes, the successors of Valentinian, and as he possessed the qualifications of courage, industry, and experience, he advanced with rapid steps in the military profession, till he was elevated, by the favor of Nepos himself, to the dignities of patrician and master-general of the troops. These troops had been long accustomed to reverence the character and authority of Orestes, who affected their manners, conversed with them in their own language, and was intimately connected with their national chieftains by long habits of familiarity and friendship. At his solicitation they rose in arms against the obscure Greek who presumed to claim their obedience, and when Orestes, from some secret motive, declined the purple, they consented, with the same faculty, to acknowledge his son, Augustulus as the emperor of the West. By the abdication of Nepos, Orestes had now obtained the summit of his ambitious hopes, but he soon discovered 
before the end of the first year, that the lessons of perjury and ingratitude which a rebel must inculcate will be retorted against himself, and that the precarious sovereign of Italy was only permitted to choose whether he would be the slave or the victim of his barbarian mercenaries. The dangerous alliance of those strangers had oppressed and insulted the last remains of Roman freedom and dignity. At each revolution their pay and privileges were augmented, but their insolence increased in a still more extravagant degree. They envied the fortune of their brethren in Gaul, Spain, and Africa, whose victorious arms had acquired an independent and perpetual inheritance, and they insisted on their peremptory demand that a third part of the lands of Italy should be immediately divided among them. Orestes, with a spirit which, in another situation, might be entitled to our esteem, chose rather to encounter the rage of an armed multitude than to subscribe the ruin of an innocent people. He rejected the audacious demand, and his refusal was favorable to the ambition of Odoacer, a bold barbarian, who assured his fellow soldiers that, if they dared to associate under his command, they might soon extort the justice which had been denied to their dutiful petitions. From all the camps and garrisons of Italy, the confederates, actuated by the same resentment and the same hopes, impatiently flocked to the standard of this popular leader, and the unfortunate patrician, overwhelmed by the torrent, hastily retreated to the strong city of Pavia, the episcopal seat of the holy Epiphantes. Pavia was immediately besieged, the fortifications were stormed, the town was pillaged, and although the bishop might labor, with much zeal and some success, to save the property of the church and the chastity of the female captives, the tumult could only be appeased by the execution of Orestes. His brother Paul was slain in an action near Ravenna, and the helpless Augustulus, who could no longer command the respect, was reduced to implore the clemency of Indoecher. That successful barbarian was the son of Edicon, who, in some remarkable transactions, particularly described in a preceding chapter, had been the colleague of Orestes himself. The honor of an ambassador should be exempt from suspicion, and Edicon had listened to a conspiracy against the life of his sovereign. But this apparent guilt was expiated by his merit or repentance. His rank was eminent and conspicuous. He enjoyed the favor of Attila, and the troops under his command, who guarded in their turn the royal village, consisted of a tribe of the Scyri, his immediate and hereditary subjects. In the revolt of the nation, they still adhered to the Huns, and, more than twelve years afterwards, the name of Edicon is honorably mentioned in their unequal contest with the Ostrogoths, which was terminated after two bloody battles by the defeat and dispersion of the Scyri. Their gallant leader, who did not survive this national calamity, left two sons, Onulf and Odoacer, to struggle with adversity, and to maintain, as they might, by rapine or service, the faithful followers of their exile. Onulf directed his steps towards Constantinople, where he sullied, by the assassination of a generous benefactor, the fame which he had acquired in arms. His brother Odoacer had a wandering life among the barbarians of Noricum, with a mind and a fortune suited to the most desperate adventures, and when he fixed his choice, he piously visited the cell of Severinus, the popular saint of the country, to solicit his approbation and blessing. The lowness of the door would not admit the lofty stature of Odoacer. He was obliged to stoop, but in that humble attitude the saint could discern the symptoms of his future greatness, and addressing him in a prophetic tone, Pursue, said he, your design. Proceed to Italy. You will soon cast away this coarse garment of skins, and your wealth will be adequate to the liberality of your mind. The barbarian, whose daring spirit accepted and ratified the petition, was admitted into the service of the Western Empire, and soon obtained an honorable rank in the guards. His manners were gradually polished, his military skill was improved, and the confederates of Italy would not have elected him for their general, unless the exploits of Odoacer had established a high opinion of his courage and capacity. Their military acclamations saluted him with the title of king, but he abstained during his whole reign from the use of the purple and diadem, lest he should offend those princes whose subjects, by their accidental mixture, had formed the victorious army which time and policy might insensibly unite into a great nation. Royalty was familiar to the barbarians, and the submissive people of Italy was prepared to obey, without a murmur, the authority which he should condescend to exercise, 
as the vice-regent of the emperor of the west. But Odoacer had resolved to abolish that useless and expensive office, and such is the weight of antique prejudice that it required some boldness and penetration to discover the extreme faculty of the enterprise. The unfortunate Augustulus was made the instrument of his own disgrace. He signified his resignation to the Senate, and that assembly, in their last act of obedience to a Roman prince, still affected the spirit of freedom and the forms of the Constitution. An epistle was addressed, by their unanimous decree, to the Emperor Zeno, the son-in-law and successor of Leo, who had lately been restored, after a short rebellion, to the Byzantine throne. They solemnly disclaim the necessity, or even the wish, of continuing any longer the imperial secession in Italy, since, in their opinion, the majesty of a sole monarch is sufficient to pervade and protect, at the same time, both the East and West. In their own name, and in the name of the people, they consent that the seat of universal empire shall be transferred from Rome to Constantinople, and they basely renounce the right of choosing their master, the only vestige that yet remained of the authority which had given laws to the world. The Republic, they repeat that name without a blush, might safely confide in the civil and military virtues of Odoacer, and they humbly request that the emperor would invest him with the title of patrician, and the administration of the diocese of Italy. The deputies of the Senate were received at Constantinople with some marks of displeasure and indignation, and when they were admitted to the audience of Zeno, he sternly reproached them with their treatment of the two emperors, Anthemius and Nepos, whom the East had successively granted to the prayers of Italy. The first, continued he, you have murdered, the second you have expelled, but the second is still alive, and whilst he lives, he is your lawful sovereign. But the prudent Zeno soon deserted the hopeless cause of his abdicated colleague. His vanity was gratified by the title of sole emperor, and by the statues erected to his honor in the several quarters of Rome. He entertained a friendly, though ambiguous, correspondent with the patrician Odoacer, and he gratefully accepted the imperial ensigns, the sacred ornaments of the throne and palace, which the barbarian was not unwilling to remove from the sight of the people. In the space of twenty years since the death of Valentinian, nine emperors had successively disappeared, and the son of Orestes, a youth recommended only by his beauty, would be the least entitled to the notice of posterity, if his reign, which was marked by the extinction of the Roman Empire in the West, did not leave a memorable era in the history of mankind. The patrician Orestes had married the daughter of Count Romulus of Petovio in Noricum. The name of Augustus, notwithstanding the jealousy of power, was known at Aquileia as a familiar surname, and the appellations of the two great founders of the city and of the monarchy were thus strangely united in the last of their successors. The son of Orestes assumed and disgraced the names of Romulus Augustus, but the first was corrupted into Momulus by the Greeks and the second has been changed by the Latins into the contemptible diminutive Augustulus. The life of this inoffensive youth was spared by the generous clemency of Odoacer, who dismissed him with his whole family from the imperial palace, fixed his annual allowance at six thousand pieces of gold, and assigned the castle of Lucullus in Campania for the place of his exile or retirement. As soon as the Romans breathed from the toils of the Punic War, they were attracted by the beauties and the pleasures of Campania, and the country house of the elder Scipio and Luternium exhibited a lasting model of their rustic simplicity. The delicious shores of the Bay of Naples was crowded with villas, and Scylla applauded the masterly skill of his rival, who had seated himself on the lofty promontory of Misenum, that commands on every side the sea and land, as far as the boundaries of the horizon. The villa of Marius was purchased within a few years by Lucullus, and the price had increased from two thousand five hundred to more than fourscore thousand pounds sterling. It was adorned by the new proprietor with Grecian arts and Asiatic treasures, and the houses and gardens of Lucullus obtained a distinguished rank in the list of imperial palaces. When the Vandals became formidable to the sea coast, the Lucullan villa on the promontory of Mycenaeum gradually assumed the strength and appellation of a strong castle, the obscure retreat of the last emperor of the West. About twenty years after that great revolution, it was converted into a church and monastery to receive the bones of St. Severinus. 
they secretly reposed, amidst the broken trophies of Cimbric and Armenian victories, till the beginning of the tenth century, when the fortifications which might afford a dangerous shelter to the Saracens were demolished by the people of Naples. Odoacer was the first barbarian who reigned in Italy, over a people who had once asserted their just superiority above the rest of mankind. The disgrace of the Romans still excites our respectful compassion, and we fondly sympathize with the imaginary grief and indignation of their degenerate posterity. But the calamities of Italy had gradually subdued the proud consciousness of freedom and glory. In the age of Roman virtue, the provinces were subject to the arms and the citizens to the laws of the Republic, till those laws were subverted by civil discord, and both the city and the provinces became the servile property of a tyrant. The forms of the Constitution, which alleviated or disguised their abject slavery, were abolished by time and violence. The Italians alternately lamented the presence or the absence of the sovereigns whom they detested or despised, and the secession of five centuries inflicted the various evils of military license, capricious despotism, and elaborate oppression. During the same period, the barbarians had emerged from obscurity and contempt, and the warriors of Germany and Scythia were introduced into the provinces as the servants, the allies, and at length the masters of the Romans, whom they insulted or protected. The hatred of the people was suppressed by fear. They respected the spirit and splendor of the martial chiefs who were invested with the honors of the empire, and the fate of Rome had long depended on the sword of those formidable strangers. The stern Ricimer, who trampled on the ruins of Italy, had exercised the power without assuming the title of a king, and the patient Romans were insensibly prepared to acknowledge the royalty of a Doerker and his barbaric successors. The king of Italy was not unworthy of the high station to which his valor and fortune had exalted him. His savage manners were polished by the habits of conversation, and he respected, though a conqueror and a barbarian, the institutions and even the prejudices of his subjects. After an interval of seven years, Odoacer restored the consulship of the West. For himself, he modestly or proudly declined an honor, which was still accepted by the emperors of the East. But the curial chair was successfully filled by eleven of the most illustrious senators, and the list is adorned by the respectful name of Basilus, whose virtues claim the friendship and the grateful applause of Sidonius, his client. The laws of the emperors were strictly enforced, and the civil administration of Italy was still exercised by the praetorian prefect and his subordinate officers. Odoacer devolved on the Roman magistrates the odious and oppressive task of collecting the public revenue, but he reserved for himself the merit of seasonable and popular indulgence. Like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy, but he revered the monastic and episcopal characters, and the silence of the Catholics attest the toleration which they enjoyed. The peace of the city required the interposition of his prefect Basilus in the choice of a Roman pontiff. The decree which restrained the clergy from alienating their lands was ultimately designed for the benefit of the people, whose devotion would have been taxed to repair the dilapidations of the church. Italy was protected by the arms of its conqueror, and its frontiers were respected by the barbarians of Gaul and Germany, who had so long insulted the feeble race of Theodosius. Odoacer passed the Hadriatic to chastise the assassins of the Emperor Nepos, and to acquire the maritime province of Dalmatia. He passed the Alps to rescue the remains of Noricum from Fava, or Philetius, king of the Rugians, who had held his residence beyond the Danube. The king was vanquished in battle, and led away a prisoner. A numerous colony of captives and subjects were transplanted into Italy. In Rome, after a long period of defeat and disgrace, might claim the triumph of her barbarian master. Notwithstanding the prudence and success of Odoacer, his kingdom exhibited the sad prospect of misery and desolation. Since the age of Tiberius, the decay of agriculture had been felt in Italy, and it was a just subject of complaint that the life of the Roman people depended on the accidents of the winds and waves. In the division and the decline of the empire, the tributary harvests of Egypt and Africa were withdrawn, the numbers of the inhabitants continually diminished with the means of subsistence, and the country was exhausted by the irretrievable losses of war, famine, and pestilence. St. Ambrose 
had deplored the ruin of a populous district, which had once adorned with the flourishing cities of Bologna, Modena, Regium, and Placentia. Pope Galasius was a subject of Odoacer, and he affirms, with strong exaggeration, that in Emilia, Tuscany, and the adjacent provinces, the human species was almost extirpated. The plebeians of Rome, who were fed by the hand of their master, perished or disappeared as soon as his liberality was suppressed. The decline of the arts reduced the industrious mechanics to idleness and want, and the senators, who might support with patience the ruin of their country, bewailed their private loss of wealth and luxury. One third of those ample estates, to which the ruin of Italy is originally imputed, was extorted for the use of the conquerors. Injuries were aggravated by insults. The sense of actual sufferings was embittered by the fear of more dreadful evils. And as new lands were allotted to new swarms of barbarians, each senator was apprehensive lest the arbitrary surveyors should approach his favorite villa or his most profitable farm. The least unfortunate were those who submitted without a murmur to the power which it was impossible to resist. Since they desired to live, they owed some gratitude to the tyrant who had spared their lives, and since he was the absolute master of their fortunes, the portion which he left must be accepted as his pure and voluntary gift. The distress of Italy was mitigated by the prudence and humanity of Odoacer, who had bound himself, as the price of his elevation, to satisfy the demands of a licentious and turbulent multitude. The kings of the barbarians were frequently resisted, deposed, or murdered by their native subjects, and the various bands of Italian mercenaries, who associated under the banner of an elective general, claimed a larger privilege of freedom and rapine. A monarchy destitute of national union and hereditary right hastened to its dissolution. After a reign of fourteen years, Odoacer was oppressed by the superior genius of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, a hero alike excellent in the arts of war and of government, who restored an age of peace and prosperity, and whose name still excites and deserves the attention of mankind. End of chapter 36, part 5